this is the parallel session, the standard model parallel session, just in case you wonder where it ended up. Uh, so the first, we'll have six talks uh, in total about a mixture of LHC and, and HERA physics, or DBNS scattering collisions in, in a broader sense. Uh, so it's almost, I think, time to start. I'll try to keep the timing so uh, people can easily move from one uh, one session. Who wants to move from, from one session to another can do that easily. So the, the first talk is by Daniel about uh, jet measurement in CMS. So uh, thanks in advance, Daniel, and I'll let you speak. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So um, let's then get right into it. Uh, I will be talking to you about a series of recent jet measurements in CMS. Um, so just to start with a little brief overview of, of why this is really very interesting to look at. So of course, first of all, um, your jet data is very sensitive to a number of things that are very interesting. So like fundamental parameters of the standard model, you have the strong coupling, which directly enters these processes, and so you can use this type of measurement to, to constrain that sector of the standard model. And uh, you can use it to constrain part on distribution functions, which of course enter the initial state of any process you want to look at at a Hadron Collider. So you benefit a lot uh, from looking at this jet data to constrain those as well. And uh, well, jet measurements tend to, uh, or jets tend to be really very abundant at Hadron Colliders. So because of that, you get kind of a high statistical precision with these measurements. And then if you combine these measurements, so for example, you have jet cross-sections together with uh, fixed order theory predictions, which have also become quite accurate. So uh, these are known to next to next leading order in perturbative QCD right now. Uh, and you, you uh, put them together in a fit, you can hopefully uh, increase the knowledge on PDFs, uh, which are just shown here in this sketch. So uh, that's one reason they're interesting. Another reason is that uh, you can use them to really go even beyond the QCD sector. So if you have reduction in association with jets of some other objects like top quarks or the Higgs boson, you can use the jet precision to, to really constrain those sector sectors and even look beyond the standard model uh, to some extensions like effective field theories. So I'll be touching mostly on the direct measurement topic in this talk uh, and um, maybe going into a little bit uh, beyond UCD as well. So getting right into it, one measurement I'd like to talk about is very recently published. This is inclusive jet production at 13 TV. And um, this is a, a double differential measurement of the inclusive jet cross section as a function of PT and rapidity. Uh, and it's done with two uh, sizes of jets. So it's done with the 0.4 cone size and a 0.7. And this is very interesting to look at sort of radius dependent effects. Um, then you have uh, shown here on the uh, right, you see that the phase space for this measurement is quite large. So it's going from a PT of the jet to just below 100 GV to up to 3 TV. Uh, so you can probe all of this and the rapidity uh, goes up to, to 2.0 here. Now, one thing that was done for the measurement is, of course, a comparison to the perturbative predictions. So here you see the comparison of data to predictions at next leading order, plus a resummation correction and next leading logarithmic, uh, and next to next leading order calculation. And you see uh, that the points go uh, very close, uh, much closer to unity when you go to next, uh, to next leading order. So it's really a, a nice improvement here in terms of the description of data by the theory. Um, and another thing that you can see is, however, if you look at the top plot at NLO, uh, there is also a comparison to the predictions for different PDF sets. And you see that particularly at the high PT region, they tend not to agree with each other that well. So hopefully by inputting this data into the PDF determination, uh, you, can, you can get the PDFs to kind of agree on, on what the cross section is in this high PT region. So the way this is done uh, for this measurement uh, includes a analysis, which is a fit of the PDF parameters together with the strong coupling constant done at next to next leading order. So this is done in a traditional approach where the PDF is parameterized with a HERA PDF like parameterization, which you can see here. And uh, it's, it's uh, giving some quite satisfactory results. So if you look at the PDF at the bottom left here, 
you see that compared to a fit that only includes the HERA data, which is not that sensitive to the gluon PDF, um, and then you add the CMS 13 TV jets, you get a significant reduction of the uh, uncertainty, particularly in the high X region here. So this is, this is very nice to see. And on the strong coupling constant front, uh, you get a value that is quite similar to what has been obtained uh, in previous CMS analyses and also is compatible with the, with the world average. Now, in particular, uh, the value of 0.117 is, is sort of kind of uh, average respected, but you see that the scale uncertainty, which was previously rather large, is now only at, uh, at eight um, in the final digit here. So uh, it, this is an improvement that is due to the next to next leading order. Uh, the overall fit quality is quite good. So we have 1.1 chi-square per degree freedom overall for the combined fit. So altogether, a very nice satisfactory look at standard model um, QCD in next to next leading order. Um, what was also done with these data is uh, that uh, a combined fit with PDFs, the strong coupling and the top pole mass. Uh, and this also includes the TT bar data because this is the one that is sensitive to, to the top quark mass. So um, by fitting these results simultaneously, the idea is to actually constrain the PDFs in the strong coupling using the inclusive jet data, and then try to use the TT bar data to get a, a better fit of the top pole mass. So you see that these results are also in nice agreement with what is kind of expected for the top mass and the previous results. Uh, there's compatibility with previous results obtained for CMS using only the TT bar data, and the strong coupling constant value doesn't change that much compared to the to the uh, PDF plus alpha is only fit. Now, another thing that you can do is, as I said, to look beyond the standard model. So uh, in this case, uh, an addition to the standard model was considered uh, where the uh, four core contact interaction as an effective field theory was, was taken into account. So here, the Lagrangian is expanded by a series of dimension six coefficients. Um, uh, dimension six operators, and you have the coefficients of these operators, which are the Wilson coefficients. So actually you can, you can fit these. And in particular, there's only one coefficient you can fit. So it's the C1 coefficient because the value of the others is given by the coupling structure. So you have one free parameter that you can fit, and there's also the energy scale here. Now you can see for a particular energy scale, uh, the results from this data. So you have um, values that are very close to zero, which is the standard model expectation, is slightly negative, but there's not really a significant excess uh, to indicate that there are uh, contact interactions beyond this, um, beyond the standard model. So we've also investigated a large energy uh, range in the energy scale, so going from 5 to 50 TV, and we can turn this into an exclusion limit as well, which is roughly uh, of, uh, 24 TV for a particular uh, contact interaction model. The PDF itself doesn't change very much, so this is an indication that it, we are able to actually constrain the PDFs uh, and even look beyond the standard model without affecting the result of this fit here too much. Uh, now, just to briefly show you a complementary measurement of inclusive jet production, this is done now at uh, a lower central mass energy using only the smaller cone size jets. And without going into too much detail here, this is a very nice playground to look at the scale dependence um, and the uh, the PDF dependence of, of this type of data and these predictions. So you have at next to leading order here a comparison between two central scale choices and you can see that one of them works uh, slightly better than the other. So this is the HT parton scale which works at next to leading order much better. But the scale uncertainty which is this red band is still relatively large. Now if you go to next to next to leading order uh, the band gets reduced so the scale uncertainty is now smaller and you can start looking at meaningful comparisons of the different PDF sets. So they also give you slightly different results. And another thing is that you can use this for determinations of the strong coupling. In this case, the uh, best fit, uh, or rather it's not really a fit, but it's going through the PDF uh, sets for different alpha S values. And the observation is that the larger alpha S values work slightly better for describing the data. Now, moving on to, to a different type of measurement, this is now multi-jet production. And the idea here was to do a, a measurement of the PT spectra for the four leading jets in the event. The reason why this is very interesting is because you start to rely more and more on parton showers to describe your high multiplicity. And um, 
there's also an interesting new approach for determining these uh, these predictions, which is the part on branching approach coupled with transverse momentum dependent PDFs and the comparison between these types of models and the more conventional part on Shire plus collinear PDF approach is explored. And you can see here the next leading order models, they have a lot of variation for the high PT when looking at the leading jet PT. Uh, whereas when you go to the next leading model models, they start to become more and more compatible. And we also see that the conventional and the TMD approaches uh, also yield comparable results. Uh, in the same vein, there is also a measurement of the jet multiplicity. But this is just basically counting the number of jets in um, various phase space regions. And this is looking now in different regions of the angular separation of the jets. So you have um, the back-to-back -back configuration here at the right, which uh, has a strong perturbative contribution. And then as you go to, to the um, uh, smaller separations here, uh, you start to see a larger and larger influence of the parton showering. So this is an interesting to evaluate these, uh, the performance of these models as well. And here, while at leading order, you can see relatively nice uh, description. At next leading order, as you go to high multiplicities, you start to see that the models begin to fail describing the data. So here, there is some improvement that can be achieved as well. Uh, now, the final aspect I want to, to present to you is this very interesting uh, measurement of jet substructure, which I think is, is a very good, um, very good input to, to sort of these types of studies. So jet substructure is a, is a nice tool, in this case, particularly for distinguishing between the various types of jet flavors. So if you look here at, uh, this is just one example of a substructure variable, which I'll get to in a moment. But if you just uh, look at it, uh, this is a comparison of a DiJet and a Z plus jet sample. And the, the main difference between these types of samples is that they have various proportions of gluon initiated jets and quark initiated jets. So a distinction here would, uh, would mean that you can distinguish with this variable uh, very well between the two flavors. And indeed, you see that the peak uh, and the, the mean value of the distribution is slightly shifted depending on which sample you look at. So this is actually a very nice uh, premise. And uh, a large number of measurements was performed here looking at very different things. So uh, the substructure variables themselves um, are quite varied. So we're looking at uh, generalized angularities here, which are just combinations um, of, over the jet constituents of momentum fractions and uh, jet axis. Uh, distances from the jet axis with various powers to control kind of the relative contribution of both uh, both things. And um, there are kind of a few traditional values for kappa and beta, which are the parameters of these angularities that you can choose. There's the Lazouche angularity, the width, the thrust, and some other variables that are interesting to look at with different properties. And then you can do all sorts of things. You can modify these uh, calculations or these, these measurements to only take into account charge constituents. So this gives you an, an increased uh, experimental precision by uh, relying on the more precise resolution of, of charged particles due to the tracker. And you can uh, use a soft drop approach to kind of call the low PT end of, um, uh, or the low energy part of the jet. So finally, you can look at what so this Daniel, result is. You have about two minutes. OK, thank you. Yeah, Good. so this is my last slide. Um, you can look at what uh, jet substructure measurements uh, actually result in. So these, this is comparing predictions to data of these jet substructure observables. So what you see here are the five um, variables that I mentioned before in the different colors. And each variable is measured for, for very different configurations. So here, the one through five uh, tells you basically a combination of a jet radius, a PT range. Sometimes you look at only the charged um, components, or you use groomed jets for it. So these are really very extensive measurements. And there's two things that you can see here in this comparison. So in the top row, um, the, this is a ratio of the substructure variable for uh, gluon enriched and quark enriched ratios. So there is a significant difference from one here, which is at the bottom of the plot here in the first four panes. Um, and you see that because of this significant difference, you get quite significant discriminatory power between uh, these two types of, of samples just by looking at the individual substructure variables. So this is looking very promising. However, if you look at the simulation of a data ratio, 
you see that there are uh, still quite some issues with describing the data. So the Monte Carlo models tend to overestimate the measurement in, in many of these uh, configurations. Um, and which can have a number of reasons. So there's a, a strong perturbative contribution here in, in some variables and others like the multiplicity and the PTD squared uh, have also a significant contribution from non-perturbative effects um, that need to be taken into account. So overall, we see that this is promising, but uh, the, the, the models uh, involved need to um, be a little bit more refined before this can be used in uh, in a really fully precise application of distinguishing quark flavors. So now um, I arrive already at the uh, summary. So uh, not to go into too much detail here, but I've shown you uh, some recent results from CMS. So the main ones were the inclusive jet cross section measurements of 13 TV and the complementary measurement of 5 TV and their comparison to the theory, which is now known to next to next leading order. And there have been very detailed analysis of the PDFs and the strong coupling constant, uh, also looking into things like the top mass and the uh, four core contact interactions beyond the standard model. And there have been some other preliminary results involving the multi jet observables, which is relevant for parton shower modeling and uh, comparison of different models there, and an extensive investigation of, of jet substructure, which reveals that some Monte Carlo models are in need of improvement. Uh, right, so with that, thank you very much for, for your attention. So if there are any questions, please go ahead. Thanks, Daniel. So uh, does anyone have any question? I'll... Okay, so I'll give you a bit of time to raise your hand and try to ask a question myself in the in the meantime. So I actually have maybe one or maybe two questions. Uh, so first, it, when you presented the, the impact on inclusive jet data, to extract the PDFs, have you used, I think it was one of your, uh, maybe slide four, around slide four, something like that, maybe. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, that includes both values of the jet radius or just uh, one of the two? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. So this is just using the, the large radius jets, uh, the 0.7 um, radius. Okay. And the the um, the reason for, for this choice is that in the past, these uh, larger jet radii have seemed to be more um, robust in, in such studies when comparing directly to the fixed order theory. Um, so that, that's what was taken. I, I'm not really sure if the 0.4 jets were in any way investigated, but the main okay. result is definitely for the 0.7. Yeah, I guess you have something similar on your, uh, probably on the, maybe the previous slide, uh, when you should, yeah, I think the, from what I remember, if you look at the NLO plus NLL calculation versus the NLO, uh, that one has probably a slightly more robust uh, description of the two jet radii, uh, more consistent. There's, there's still an undershooting or overshooting depending on, on what relative to what you're talking about. But at least the NLL tends to uh, slightly alleviate the, the, ten, the tension between 0.4 and 0.7. Uh, so I was wondering whether that would have an impact in the uh, in the fit. So yeah, okay, 0.7 so, I think is the standard uh, the standard one to use here. It wasn't used in the fit, but uh, I think I have a slide showing you the 0.4 results as well. So um, this is just a comparison to the theory. Okay. Uh, sometimes it works better than the large radius, but here and in a low, you start to see some um, some effects. So I can't really uh, speak okay. to, to more precise things here. Yet. Have you tried the NNLO plus uh, jet radius resumation? Uh, I don't think this has been uh, tried. So it didn't, it didn't enter the, the, the final result. Um, not aware if there were any internal studies on this, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks. Well, I see Francesco has uh, his hands raised. Good morning. So please go ahead. Hi, Daniel. Thanks a lot for this very comprehensive talk on these new CMS results. I have a question about your slide four. Can you go back, please? Sure. I mean, it's about the chi square. I mean, as you probably know, I mean, also Atlas try to fit the inclusive jet data, even I mean, both at eight and thirteen TB. And we have never achieved such a good chi-square as you do in, in this table here. So my question is, I mean, do you have, have you, have you applied any decorrelation for the systematic uncertainty or, I mean, 
in particular, I don't know, something related to the jet systematic uncertainty, or I mean, this is the quality of the fit straight on. Uh, so the, the systematic uncertainties uh, have, of course, different uh, dependence depending on which phase space region you are in. And this is, I think, it's very extensively uh, divided into the different sources. Um, so these are all things that, that do enter the fit. It's not a decorrelation per se, because this, this is really the, the standard way to look at, for example, jet energy scale uncertainties within CMS. So there's, I don't think there's anything done that really differs from, from what was done previously, except that uh, probably now the, the determination of, uh, of these uncertainties uh, has been looked into a bit more detail since, since a lot more time has passed. So. Um, this is essentially what, what comes out of the fit firsthand. Um, okay, I mean, I mean, I can tell you that Atlas to give, uh, to, to obtain such a good chi-square, I mean, for example, I mean, we deco fully decorrelated among the various rapidity bin, the jet flavor response systematic. So I was wondering if you did something similar. Right, so unfortunately, I don't know if, uh, if any complicated correlation of this type of systematic has been taken into account, I think it's really very basically either 100% correlated sources uh, or completely uncorrelated ones. So there's no um, there's no study of how the correlation can impact this uh, this result. So this is probably each of the systematic sources for the jet energy scale is considered to be 100% correlated across uh, across all regions. Correlated. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Although you have a split in um, things like end cap sensitive regions and barrel sensitive regions, so there is indirectly a form of the correlation. The model is quite complex. Fortunately, I can't really go into too many details here since <laughs> I don't have them. But yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. I will have a look at the paper. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Good to have a discussion. Uh, actually, that last question is a perfect transition to the next uh, talk. So thanks again, uh, Daniel, for this uh, review of the CMS results. Yeah. And now we, we're going to be moving to Evelyn's talk, who's going to be speaking about uh, actually PDF determination from jet measurements in Atlas. So again, that's a perfect transition. So Evelyn, can you share your slides? Uh, yes, I'm trying, I don't understand why. It doesn't work. Just one second. Huh? Good, good. Okay. Uh, what is the problem here? Try to see. Hmm? Okay. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, okay. So please go ahead. Okay, so good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to present today the latest result of the Atlas collaboration on proton parton distribution function. So as you know, PDF are key ingredient to provide theoretical prediction at the LHC. And just, I just remind you that PDF uncertainties are the dominant uncertainties for high precision measurements, such as the WMAPs and the weak mixing angle. They are also important limiting factor for the X physics, and they have also an impact on searches. Indeed, the discovery of new physics rely on the precise knowledge of uh, PDF. Currently, the frontal high energy physics at colliders require percent level accuracy for PDF in order um, to resolve potential effect of beyond standard model physics in high precision standard model measurement. And now LHC experiment may contribute to this effort. As you know, currently LHC measurement are used in global PDF fit and they provide an important complementary information to, uh, to data set from DIS and fixed target experiment in a corner of phase space previous unexplored, but we can do, we can contribute further to these efforts. Indeed, PDF fit from LHC collaboration not only allow a first direct test of the sensitivity of PDF of our measurement, but they also represent a precious vademecum for global PDF fit in collaboration on how to use um, LHC data in the fit. 
And uh, the Atlas experiment has always been in the forefront of this challenge. In the past, we published uh, a PDF fit where we used the, 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 the data plus the Atlas inclusive WZ cross-section measurement at 7 uh, TD. And the fit provided the uh, separation of uh, quark flavor. Adding to this fit uh, the boson plus uh, jet um, cross-section measurement at 8 TV, we were able to provide the, the to, to probe higher um, X for uh, this uh, flavor, uh, quark flavor separation. While adding the TT bar cross-section uh, measurement in a fit with era data plus the inclusive WZ cross-section measurement at 7 TV, we probed uh, the gluon distribution uh, in, um, at medium and high X. Today, I'm going to present the latest result of uh, the Atlas PDF fit for uh, the first time at a conference. It results in the Atlas PDF 21 set, where we further enhanced the sensitivity to PDF, including in the fit a much larger amount of Atlas data, and where we performed the tailored tests that are relevant when um, the aim is a percent level uh, accuracy. So, in addition to the WZ inclusive cross-section measurement at 7TV that have been already used in previous Atlas um, fit, now we are using also the available result at uh, ATV. And depending on the data set, we used the differential cross-section measurement as a function of uh, the um, lepton rapidity, the rapidity of um, the boson, or the... Um, the polar angle of the lepton in uh, the collis stopper frame. For what concern the boson plus jet data at ATV, in the fit we used as uh, done in the past, the PT of the W boson and the rapidity of the jet in different bin of the jet PT for the Z plus jet data set. We also used for the first time the um, inclusive uh, photon uh, result of the Atlas experiment, in particular the ratio of the cross-section measurement at 13 and 8 TV as a function of the transverse energy of the photon in different bin of um, the photon rapidity. For what concern the TT bar measurement, we used as done in the past the eight, uh, several distribution of the ATB result in the dilepton and the lepton plus jet channel, and we used for the first time the 13 TB result of the lepton plus jet channel. Of course, we couldn't ignore uh, our uh, inclusive jet measurement. In the fit, we used the jet PT distribution in different, uh, in different bin of the jet rapidity at ATV. And we performed the tailored um, cross-check with the 7TV and the 13TV dataset. So here I show the summary of all uh, Atlas data set used in the fit with it more than uh, 600 Atlas uh, data point. The backbones of the fit remain that uh, era data that indeed provide good constraint in a quite uh, large range of X, but we have to take in mind that we need Atlas data in order to provide the flavor separation in the C and uh, the gluon PDF at high X. We fit the data with prediction that are NNLO in QCD plus electroweak correction at uh, NLO. And uh, this is uh, the current uh, state of art of modern um, PDF. And we used the X uh, fitter framework uh, for uh, the fit. So here I show the parametrization that we adopted for you and the valence work for um, light antiquark and for uh, gluon. The normalization parameter AI and the slope parameter, parameter BI for uh, the light antiquark are um, assumed all independent to, to each other. And this strategy has uh, only recently been adopted by some global PDF fitters. As done in the past, we assume that the S distribution is equal to anti S. The AI parameter for valence quark and for gluon are set by uh, the 
some uh, rule. For what concern uh, the D, E, and F parameter appearing here in uh, the polynomial, they are added for each distribution until there is no further significant improvement in the, in the k-square. And this results in 21 uh, free parameter uh, in the fit. For uh, the gluon, we added this uh, negative term here, where the exponential here is set to an high value in order to avoid the negative contribution at uh, high x. For what concerns the key square, the form is the standard one uh, adopted in ERA and in Atlas uh, PDF fit. I would like to stress that we consider the correlation of statistical and systematic uncertainties within and between uh, Atlas dataset. And here in this table, I show the correlation scheme for systematic uncertainty so between a different um, dataset. The, uh, the correlation of uh, jet. Um, uncertainties and in particular the jet energy scale correlation play the dominant rule. This is somehow expected since these, uh, the jet energy scale are the major uncertainty for most of the measurement. But we also consider the correlation of uh, smaller uncertainties like the lepton and the background uncertainty when um, relevant and when uh, available. We performed a detailed study on uh, the um, correlation, and here I show the impact on uh, correlations as an example for uh, the D valence, the anti D, and um, the gluon at a scale that is relevant for the LHC physics and focusing in the range of middle X, where W, Z, and X are uh, produced. Here we compare the result of the nominal fit in in uh, red with a fit where the correlation between the data set are uh, ignored. We see that the difference in PDF are uh, not uh, large and PDF uncertainties are uh, similar. The main impact is on the D sector, but correlation can be important when the aim is a percent level accuracy on uh, PDF. And let me now discuss the impact of uh, the different uh, data set. Here uh, we compare the result of the nominal fit in red with the result of a fit where we removed uh, some uh, data set in blue. So without the W plus uh, the WZ inclusive data, the strange density that here is uh, represented as the ratio of the strange to the light antiquark, as you know, as you see here, is very poorly determined. If we fix the attention on the nominal result, the red curve, we see that this confirmed the unsuppressed strangeness at low X already seen in previous atlas um, fit. We see here that without the W plus jet uh, data, there is very little information on the strange density at high X. This uh, big change of um, of the, um, of the curve is uh, due to the fact that the boson plus jet data resolve a double minimum in the rest of the data that uh, marginally prefer the blue configuration. And this effect has been already uh, studied in detail in the previous Atlas publication on PDF fit using the boson plus jet uh, data. So when uh, we add the TT bar data, we get a gluon distribution that is softer at high X and the uncertainty in this region get uh, reduced. As expected, the main, uh, the main impact on jet and gluon is all, and sorry, on jet and direct photon is also on uh, gluon in the high X uh, range. In addition to the experimental uncertainty that I show in the previous slide and that are the dominant uncertainty to the fit, we also considered the parametrization uncertainty, adding extra parameter um, to the fit and the modeling uncertainty, such as the variation of the minimum Q square of the era data, the starting scale of the fit and the masses of the heavy quark. If we look at um, the result, uh, we see that the experimental uncertainties are better determined in the U sector than in uh, the D sector. For what concern uh, gluon PDF, it is well determined for central uh, value of X, but we are still dominated by large uncertainty at low and high X. 
We also performed a... So, Evelyn, you, you have about three minutes left. Okay. We have also performed a detailed study on uh, the scale uncertainty. I remind you that uh, we fit the data to NNLO QCD predictions. So scale uncertainty are uh, in general smaller than experimental uncertainties. They are compatible with experimental uncertainty only in the inclusive WZ production case and so in this case they have been included in the fit correlated between w and z and between seven and atp and here we show the impact of the scale treatment for the divalence the anti d and um, the gluon in red as usual the nominal fit in blue the result of the fit where a scale uncertainty are not accounted and in green the result of the fit where a scale uncertainty are treated as uncorrelated we see that overall the effect of the scale scale uncertainty is not large, but again, it can be important when the aim is a percent level accuracy. We also studied the impact of the scale uncertainty on other data set, and um, as uh, expected, uh, it has been found uh, negligible. We also performed a detailed study on the key square tolerance in previous uh, atlas and era fit as in the plot I shown until now, the experimental uncertainties have been evaluated with a uh, key square tolerance equal to one, but now we have considered that we are um, using more disparate atlas data. We know that some global PDF group use enhanced um, key square, other group use other methods but obtain similar uncertainty. So we performed a study on appropriate tolerance applied in the procedure of the MSG, MSHT group, and we adopted um, tolerance equal to three. We see here that when we compare the Atlas uh, fit with uh, this um, criterion with the other um, the global PDF fit, we get indeed a similar uncertainty with some difference that is anyway understood. Just as an example, the larger uncertainty of um, the Atlas fit at high X for the U bar distribution is due to the mixing uh, the missing fixed um target gradient data in the atlas fit or the larger uncertainty at ix of the gluon distribution is due to the missing jet tevatron data and let me finally present the result of the atlas fit with full uncertainty again in red compared with global pdf fit we see that the atlas fit agree with the global PDF fit as well as they agree to each other. Moreover, the Atlas data bring the PDF much closer to the global PDF than uh, the era PDF 2.0 shown here and here in, uh, in orange. And so this brings me to the conclusion. We fit all available Atlas data sensitive to PDF that have information on correlated systematic uncertainty. We fit our data to NNLO QCD plus NLO electroweak prediction. I already discussed it in detail the impact of the different data set. An enhanced tolerance is used for a realistic PDF um, uncertainty estimation and the atlas fit is in reasonable agreement with the modern pdf i would like to stress again that um, the correlation between data set have been included and the information is made public to global pdf fitters we also considered the scale uncertainty when relevant but the experts are relatively small but important for future high precision measurement of the um, standard model parameter and i would like uh, to say again that this work represents a precious vademecum on the treatment of the Atlas data for global PDF fitting collaboration. Uh, I've done. Thanks a lot for uh, your attention. Okay, thanks a lot, Evelyn, for this uh, detailed talk on PDFs in Atlas. Uh, does anyone have a question? We have actually a few minutes for questions. No, so I don't see any any hand raised. Uh, let me ask something then. The uh, so. You investigated the effect of different data sets on the uh, on the PDF extraction. Uh, I vaguely remember hearing in the past that there was some tension between the TT bar and inclusive jet sets uh, data sets, at, especially on the high X gluon. Is it something that you see as well, or 
uh, um, no, in the sense that, okay, going here. So what we see now that we add all the data set is, as I said in the talk, that the TT bar move basically the, uh, the gluon distribution software. And this is due to the fact that um, somehow when uh, we include the jet data, they move uh, instead the gluon PDF harder. But uh, they are uh, anyway consistent. There is okay. not, uh, let's say, a significant uh, discrepancy. It's just... Uh, Okay, thanks. I see Daniel has a question. There's a question. Sorry, go ahead, Gazin. Yes, hi. So first of all, thanks for the really nice talk, uh, for the comprehensive look into the, the PDF. So um, you mentioned at the beginning that you are using the ATV data from the inclusive jet side and using the 7 and 13 TV as a cross check. And I was wondering uh, what the uh, what this cross check looks like. So, are you just substituting then in the big fit the ATV inclusive jets with the seven and the thirteen, and looking at at the impact or? Um... Yes, so, yeah. so I have a backup slide on uh, on this. First of all, we used the ATV data in place of the 13 of the 7, because for ATV, we had the available result at 0 0.6 in radius, and we have also the result at 0 0.4, so we used the difference of the two as modeling uncertainty. I didn't mention it in the talk because it's a small contribution with respect to other model uncertainties. Later, what we did basically is is um, summarized in this two plot here. So we substituted, in, uh, we run basically the nominal fit. So ATV data are 0 0.7 with, uh, with this is uh, the, um, the comparison in blue with uh, the result uh, with the other uh, R radius 0 0.4. So this is uh, the effect of the change. And later we run the 13 TV data that are available only at 0 0.4. Then the result is uh, the green line here and the 7 TV at 0 0.6, the other result. And uh, we see that uh, within the total uncertainty of the fit, the difference are um, negligible, uh, basically. We cannot use all uh, together uh, the jet data because we don't uh, know the, the correlation of the uncertainties, basically. So this is the only way that uh, we had to prove it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, really nice. It's, it's just that the, uh, just a small additional comment. So the, uh, the, the other data set seems to really uh, sometimes reach the edge of your uncertainty. So it definitely is, is worth to fit the data set in some way together. But as you say, the, the correlations need to be worked out. Uh, so yeah. Yes, maybe, maybe this now. is a nice idea. For <laughs> yes, exactly. Maybe in the near future or far future. Okay, well, thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the questions, talks, and everything, uh, and the answers, Evelyn. Uh, I don't see anyone else, so I suggest we uh, we move on to the uh, to the next uh, so next talk. So we're going to switch gear a little bit and now move to uh, to Hera physics. And I guess the first speaker of the series is Henry talking about one jettiness in the bright frame at high Q square. So Henry. Uh, Hi. Hello. Uh, can you share your screen? Looks good. Perfect. Thanks. So All go right. ahead. Great. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm lucky to be following some uh, nice talks. Uh, so disclaimer, it's 4 a.m. for me. I'm on the East Coast in the U.S. So <laughs> if I'm not making sense, uh, just ask me for clarification or send me an email. Um, all right. So um, we're looking here at um, this kind of jet shape observable, the one jettiness um, in the bright frame at high Q squared. And um, at Hera, we're looking at neutral current, deep and elastic scattering, um, which you know is a clean collision system where we have direct access to the kinematic variables um, that we know and love, namely Q squared, Y, and Bjorkane X. Um, so the bright frame um, for some people involved in Hadron Colliders uh, is maybe slightly unfamiliar, um, but it's basically the frame where um, the incoming parton has its momentum more or less reversed. So it's sometimes called the brick wall frame um, because one can imagine it as the parton coming in, hitting a brick wall and coming out. Um, and I use, I use kind of a few things to describe this. Um, you, so it's, it's cleanly divided into two hemispheres one of which is called kind of the beam or remnant or target 
hemisphere interchangeably. Um, and this kind of over here on the left, this HB, um, is where kind of the, the remnant of the proton ends up, whereas this HC is kind of where the struck quark ends up. Um, so you get a nice geometrical separation um, between the two uh, processes. Um, so what we're measuring uh, is the one jettiness event shape, um, which is a infrared safe um, and theoretically clean observable because it's free from these kind of non-global logarithms that complicate things. Um, and it's sensitive to alpha S and PDFs, and it can be calculated quite precisely um, in soft collinear effective theory and PQCD. Um, so what this observable is, is it's um, the minimum dot product um, of every particle in the event with one of two vectors. And these two vectors are defined by um, basically the beam um, and then uh, some jet axis, um, which is defined by the kinematics of the event. Um, and there's kind of an equivalent definition that follows from momentum conservation, which is more or less just the sum of the longitudinal momentum in the bright frame uh, with a normalization factor. Uh, and it's nice because only in this definition, only particles in the current hemisphere um, contribute, um, which is experimentally favorable. So we're using here the H1 experiment um, at HERA um, with a root S of 319 GB. Um, H1 is a hermetic detector with an H symmetric design, um, had a drift chamber um, and silicon tracking. Um, but kind of the centerpiece of the detector was the high resolution liquid argon calorimeter um, that did a great job measuring um, both EM and hadronic particles. Um, and uh, particles are reconstructed with kind of a particle flow algorithm. Um, and the trigger uh, is highly efficient for uh, Y less than 0.7. So if we look here at some event displays, um, on the left here, um, we have a, basically a DAS one jet event um, where you can see that um, so this kind of spray of particles is the jet. This kind of gray line is the scattered electron. Um, and you can see that um, you have a nicely collimated event. And in this case, um, you have a small tau 1b because uh, the dot product um, with the so-called qj of these particles is low. Um, on the other hand, when you have kind of a dijet event or a kind of spherical event, um, you have a large uh, one jettiness uh, by definition. Um, so the nice thing about event shapes is that they're inclusive observables. Um, and so um, one needs to look at the inclusive DAS observables. Um, so in this, in this analysis, we're looking at uh, Q squared greater than 150 GV squared um, and inelasticity Y between 0.2 and 0.7. Uh, and we're analyzing the 351.7 inverse picobarns collected uh, during the HERA2 data taking period. Um, the two kind of signal Monte Carlo generators we're looking at are uh, wrap gap, which implements a matrix element plus parton shower approach, and Django, which implements color dipole model. Um, and despite the name um, wrap gap, both of these are kind of full DAS generators. Um, it's not just photo production. Um, so the backgrounds for the, for these, um, for this measurement, um, are quite small. The dominant ones are kind of photo production and low Q squared neutral current DAS kind of faking as a high Q squared DAS. Um, and in this case, the DAS kinematics are reconstructed with the I Sigma method, which has the nice feature that, um, it's independent of the, um, potentially damaging uh, QED ISR, which is kind of a pain in the neck when you're trying to reconstruct the kinematic variables generally. Um, so since this is kind of a fully inclusive observable, all events contribute some value to the uh, tau spectrum. Um, well, that's interesting. That's supposed to be <laughs> uh, the equation. Anyway, um, so in these plots here, zero degrees is kind of the, so each, each particle kind of also contributes some amount to the spectrum. So um, with zero degrees defined as kind of the proton going direction and 180 degrees defined as the electron going direction, um, we can break out into the individual normalized contributions to the observable, um, you know, whether it's a track or a cluster and what energy. 
And um, we see that tracks in kind of the central detector region from 25 degrees to 135 degrees uh, dominate the spectrum um, with also a large contribution from clusters in the central detector, um, both of which are generally well measured. Um, and then uh, if you look at the energy of these individual particles, um, the majority are uh, tracks and clusters with greater than one GeV, which are well measured in general by the detector. Um, so kind of the fundamental quantity when we're looking at this um, tau Q for the measurement is this PZ bright, um, because that's basically what we're summing over. And um, when we look at this, um, we see very good agreement between um, the H1 uh, data and the detector simulation, um, which is this these curves of Django and RabGap here, both for clusters and for tracks. Um, so that's great. Um, so here's here's kind of the, the first, um, when I'm first showing you the actual tau Q spectrum. Um, so this peak on the left here um, is more or less um, born level like DIS one jet events. Um, as you go to larger um, tau Q, um, you get, so these events are kind of die jet events greater than 0.5. And then um, this large spike at one is um, die jet events where both jets end up in the beam hemisphere. Um, because looking at this definition here, if you have no particles in the bright frame, uh, your tau Q is one. Um, and you can see from um, this plot here that um, the detector simulation does an okay job of describing the data, but um, you can clearly resolve the differences um, between these two models, especially in kind of the higher uh, tau Q region. So um, the way we kind of went about doing this measurement um, is kind of a bin by bin correction technique uh, where the cross section is kind of defined as the number of events in the data minus the number of events in the background divided by the luminosity uh, multiplied by a bin width correction. Um, the C unfold is a um, constant taken from comparison of um, particle level simulation and detector level simulation. And then the CQED um, is kind of a QED correction factor, uh, which is taken by comparing radiative and non-radiative Monte Carlo. Um, so the cross section that we're reporting here um, is basically the um, particle level. Um, we're extrapolating the data to the uh, non-radiative particle level. Um, so looking at um, our plot over here, um, we see that the kind of peak region is um, not really especially well described by any of the models in this plot. Um, Ring, Jep, <laughs> Rev, Jep, and Django kind of uh, underestimate the data while um, Pythia plus Dyer tends to overestimate it. Um, in the kind of larger tau region, um, RapGap and Django uh, do a little bit better, um, but Pythia plus Dyer underestimates. Um, so if we compare some different parton showers just within Pythia, um, you can see that the peak region is really quite sensitive to the specifics of um, which model you're using. So um, Pythia plus Dyer, Pythia plus Vincia, and standard default kind of Pythia 8.3 give quite different results. Um, and really none of them um, really completely capture the data over the full spectrum. Um, we also have comparisons of um, the process EP, EP to two jets plus X from NNLO jet. Um, and here non-perturbative corrections are just taken out of Pythia. Um, and in general, they're large at low tau 1b, um, which is kind of expected. But the NNLO um, plus uh, non-perturbative corrections um, really does quite a good job, kind of the best job um, at describing the tail region, um, which is kind of uh, to be expected. So that's good. Um, and you can see here kind of the difference between the red and the light blue um, is quite sizable um, at lower tau 1b. So um, the nice thing about doing things inclusively is you can break it out um, into a triple differential measurement in um, tau 1b 
q squared and y, the inelasticity. Um, so in these kind of patch plots, um, we have increasing y, or we have increasing y from left to right, and then we have increasing q squared from bottom to top. Um, so as you increase q squared, um, you see that generally the peak tends to shift further to the left um, as one kind of expects. You expect your jets to be more collimated. And you also see that the, um, the tail region kind of dies off at higher Q squared, um, which is also kind of to be expected. Um, so that's great. Um, as you increase Y, um, you can kind of see that this little, this peak at tau equals one um, tends to increase in size a little bit. And that's kind of from the, um, just the, the kinematics favoring the case where um, both jets end up in the beam hemisphere uh, in the break frame. So Henry, you have about a bit more than two minutes left. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks. Um, so here, here I have plotted the ratios to the data. Um, the statistical uncertainties across these bins range from a few percent to a few tens of percent. The systematic uncertainties um, in most of the bins are around 5%. Um, Django and RepGap generally do a good job um, describing the full phase space. Um, and in general, Pythia and Dyer are a bit too large. Um, to compare to some more models, um, I have here also um, Pythia with the default shower, um, Pythia plus Vincia and Herwig. Um, Herwig has some kind of strange behavior. Uh, it, it underestimates the DIS cross-section and it also has kind of this bump um, so this may be something um, with this version of Herwig that we're using, um, we're still kind of ironing that out. Um, so to now compare um, triple differentially the uh, NNLO prediction, um, you can see that um, at the lower Q squared, um, the non-perturbative uh, corrections, which are basically the difference between this red line and this light blue line uh, are increasing. Um, whereas at higher Q squared, they're more or less negligible. Um, the, the NNLO um, with non-perturbative corrections um, kind of everywhere does the best job um, at describing the data, um, even better than um, Pythia and um, quite uh, significantly better in some places than uh, the NNLO. Um, so uh, in summary, um, this has been the first measurement of the one jettiness event shape in neutral current DAS. Um, we agree quite well with um, perturbative QCD predictions. Um, upcoming is a comparison with the N3LL prediction and an NNLO plus parton shower. Um, and in general, uh, this observable is kind of highly sensitive to model parameters. Um, so it's, it'll be very useful for tuning the Monte Carlos. Um, especially since we have a US-based electron ion collider coming soon. Um, and we're looking to explore the sensitivity to alpha S and the PDFs um, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and a combined extraction of these two quantities uh, should be possible. Um, so in general, it's a promising measurement for the EIC and other future EP colliders. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Henry, for this uh, nice uh, analysis. So does anyone have uh, an immediate question? Okay, I'm getting used to this. So there's no questions, let me ask something. Uh, so I was actually going to ask you 30 seconds before the end of your talk, whether you had investigated uh, recent predictions for this since you motivated that at the beginning that there's ways to, uh, to get high accuracy precisions. Mm -hmm. uh, calculations here. So you briefly mentioned you had the n cube and l uh, mm -hmm. in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. So that's, um, I guess, being done by um, Chris Lee and collaborators. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of a in progress um, calculation and in comparison with the data. So I, I suspect you're going to have a potential issues with non perturbative corrections or big non perturbative uncertainty in that region. Um, yeah, I guess it, it's a, it's a matter of, um, yeah, I guess it, it's a matter of how they, um, choose to 
handle that. I don't know the details of the <laughs> um, theory. <laughs> well, I guess you, but... can, you, you can go to high Q score because I was looking at your one but last slide uh, mm -hmm. where it seems indeed that non positive corrections are much smaller at uh, at high Q square. Yeah, that one. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know if that extends down to small values of toe is what I wanted to ask? Well, so it, in the fixed order, I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine that you know, I mean, it's you because at low tau, you're really looking at the, you know, one jet. It's a one jet event, so basically, mm -hmm. it's all kind of non perturbative. Um, I don't know. I, I would imagine that. Th so typically, that's kind of captured um, in the um, NNLL predictions. Um, okay. They kind of do a better job describing that region um, than the fixed order. Okay, I actually have another small question, which is, is there any other jet shape you'd like to measure, which would potentially be either uh, going in the same direction as, as uh, one jettiness or give complementary information? Right, so um, we, we also kind of um, have some preliminary measurements in the pipeline of the kind of more standard um, event shapes, broadening thrust, um, things yes, like that. Yes, very um, Right. Um, so that's that's also something that we're looking into. And then we're also um, doing a measurement of um, uh, groomed event shapes as well, which is something that's kind okay. of um, new and interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was that's one of the things I had in mind as well. So thanks for mentioning it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess in particular in the peak region that can seriously decrease your non perturbative uncertainties and hence be more helpful for tuning bottom shower Monte Carlos, for example. Exactly. Uh, OK, well. Thanks a lot. Is there any anyone willing to ask something? Last chance. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Henry, for giving mm -hmm. this talk in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> thanks for I having hope me. you managed to find some rest before or after. <laughs> okay, uh, so still staying with uh, with Hera physics, we're moving uh, to Zeus now. Uh, so, Devon, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing this. Uh, Devon. Right. Devon. Okay, good. Thanks for the yeah. fix. Okay, so Devon. Uh, yeah. So now it's okay. Devon, you're going to speak about azimuthal alteration in photo production on behalf of Zeus. So please uh, feel free to share your screen and, and go okay. ahead. So you you heard me and you see me, yeah? Well, I hear I hear you. I see you perfectly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Next step is the slides. Thanks. Okay. All right. Now you see the slides. Good. Perfect. So still, still the middle of the night. Yes. Also for me. Okay. All right. So yeah, I'll be talking about azimuthal correlations uh, in photo production and deep elastic scattering uh, at Hera with the Zeus detector. So there are two motivating questions for this analysis. Um, the first one is how small can a colliding system be while still exhibiting the collective features typically associated with this so-called cork gluon plasma that we observe in heavy ion collisions. And then the second part of the analysis is about multi-parton interactions. And it's a, we try to understand the relationship between MPI and this collective environment that's observed um, in, in heavy ion collisions and also in uh, smaller hydronic collisions. So yeah, I'll be presenting recent measurements with um, the Zeus detector in both neutral current DIS and photo production. And we have a, a, a new publication on this subject. So we start with observations in uh, heavy ion collisions, namely lead lead at the LHC. So this on the left side, you see a um, what's called a ridge plot. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a two particle correlation. So delta eta is the separation and pseudo rapidity of the pair. Delta phi is that in uh, azimuth. And you see this, this double ridge. This, so there's one ridge here with a jet peak in the middle and then an away side ridge. So a near side ridge and an away side ridge. And this feature, long story short, is interpreted as, as a sign of fluid-like behavior, uh, but a, a QCD fluid, not a QED fluid. And that's what's called the cork gluon plasma. And OK, so that was observed uh, roughly around 2000. The year two, this, this is the LAC plot, but this was observed, observed before that at, at RIC 
roughly in 2000. And then when the LHC turned on, there was a big surprise um, when we saw something quite similar in proton-proton collisions, so a much smaller initial state. We also see, you see there's a, there's a this is, um, yeah, so you see a, a near side ridge here. It's much smaller than the away side ridge, but you still see a, a double ridge uh, in this plot. And, and that was a big surprise because in these systems, it was thought to be, um, uh, this, the initial state was too small and living too short to um, produce a, a thermally equilibrated state. But nevertheless, we saw it, and we also see it in the intermediate P lead, uh, which is also produced at the LHC. So then the natural question is, of course, um, what about even more fundamental um, electron proton scattering at Hera? Can, can we see it there too? Like, how far does this go? So this is um, the Hera Collider in Hamburg. Uh, um, so it took data between 1992 and 2007. And the two principal detectors are, are H1 and, and Zeus. And uh, this, the root S of the collisions is 318 uh, GeV. So there are two regimes of scattering at HERA. Um, the, the first one, the most popular one to study is deep and elastic scattering. And that's the case where this um, exchange photon between the incoming electron and the proton um, is very virtual. So the Q squared is, is much, much larger than lambda QCD squared. And in this case, it probes a very small region of the proton, um, like as, as shown here, hitting one quark, for instance. Um, and it, it, the dimensions of this region are, are given here, or, or roughly inversely related to the, um, to the, to the Q squared. Um, and yeah, so neutral current DIS involves the exchange of a photon or, or a Z boson. And then the other regime of interest, uh, which was the main interest of this last analysis um, on Zeus, is this um, that I performed, is photoproduction. And that's the case where um, the virtuality of this exchange photon is near zero. So it's, it's nearly a real photon. And then this, this photon can exchange or can um, fluctuate into quark and gluon matter. And then that matter then um, scatters uh, with the proton. So then it's more like a, ha it's, it's more hadron-like, this, this initial collision. And then in this case in particular, you have the possibility of multi-parton interactions, MPI. So in this case, I drew three, um, three scatters, three gluon exchanges. So this would be a case of three MPI in this one event. And that's another thing we want to look for. So here's a, a, a picture, a rough schematic picture of the Zeus detector. Um, and I have the main track, uh, main, main cuts listed here on the right. Um, I'll just go over them briefly. So um, there's a, we reject the scattered electron from the analysis in, in deep and elastic scattering. So uh, on the, in this picture, the proton beam is coming uh, from the right and the electron beam fr from the left. And then you know, you, in DIS, you see a scat often a scattered electron in the, in the detector, and that's this, uh, this dashed red line. So this is used to help identify DIS versus uh, photo production, of course. Uh, but in the analysis, we reject this track because we want to study the produced uh, a matter in this, in this interaction. Um, and the rapidity, pseudo rapidity is negative 1.5 to two, PT 0.1 to five. And another important one is that this is all high multiplicity. So, and, and the number of charged particles in, in this kinematic window is greater than or equal to 20 particles. And that's the same for the DIS sample and the photo production sample. So, um, uh, we studied um, two particle correlations. And you'll see later on this CN2, which is just the average value of cosine N delta phi, the phi of particle one and the phi of particle two. And N is the harmonic, which characterizes the, um, the shape, the top topology of um, the event. And so here's, I give you a rough, rough schematic on what to expect. So for the first harmonic C12, this two here is the number of particles, because you can also do a, a C, um, C14 for four particle correlations. But I'm showing two particle correlations. So one is, uh, is the directivity of the event. And the second order, which is very popular in heavy ion collisions to study, is the elliptic asymmetry. So back-to-back -back 
back to back topologies. And we're going to just focus on these two harmonics. So um, and before I show more C, C um, 1, 2, and C2, two, two, let's go back to these ridge style plots. So here's our, our results for those. Um, on the left is photo production. So Q squared less than 1 GeV squared. And on the right is um, deep and elastic scattering. And you see um, the, the near side peak, that's a, like a jet peak, that's there clearly in both. You see the away side ridge, which is also interpreted as a, an, um, an away side jet, but which is um, smeared because the axis fluctuates the longitudinally event by event. But you don't see a near side ridge in, in either case here. Now these plots don't have any systematic uncertainties um, as always. So uh, these are just qualitative, but you clearly, it's clearly not something that just pops out um, this double side, uh, the double ridge that you see um, in hadronic collisions at the LHC. Um, okay, and then now the second part is about MPI. And so that again, that's cases where there's more than one two to two scattering per event. So here, this is one from a Pythia publication showing two scatters, quark, quark, and gluon, gluon. And we assess this MPI using um, um, Pythia expectations. And this is an established feature in high multiplicity hadronic collisions, but it has not been observed conclusively in EP scattering. So another interesting possibility that might precede the, the um, initial multi-parton interactions is um, this a rescattering phase. So I draw here three uh, sources. So, so these are the three MPIs that generate, say, gluons that are emanating from these regions. And this, this whole region of the MPIs is, you know, it can be very irregular and it changes event by event. And that's, I just drew one particular case here. And then what's I want to point out here is that you could have a, a rescattering phase. So that's where the, the matter per, or the gluons produced from one MPI scatters with the that of another MPI. And, and this, if you have a lot of that, that is what could produce a thermal system where you might expect this collectivity that you see in heavy ion collisions. Um, but okay, it, it is a bit far-fetched to assume there's a lot of it in EP, um, but this in principle, it could happen. And that's what we want to look for. That's the collectivity. So if there's a lot of rescattering here, um, then you could expect a collective environment to form. So here's um, the result in photo production for um, the multiplicity distribution and uh, in, in black points, and then compared to various Pythia expectations. Now, the main parameter I'm adjusting is this PT0, and that controls the number of MPI. Um, it just re it regulates the cross section and also. Um, um, depth and, or controls the IR divergencies. And then in Pythia, they give an energy dependence to this. Um, and it's based on, I think, um, quite involved fits. And so the prefactor here is PT0 ref, and that's what I'm changing. And so you should just know that the more MPI there are in, in, in the Pythia that I generate it, it is corresponding to lower PT0 ref. So here's three choices of PT0 ref, two, three, and four and the, number of M, the mean number of MPI in each case. So for two, PT0 ref equals two, the number of MPI is eight. So that's quite a lot, eight partonic scatterings, pair partonic scatterings per event. So that's this black line. And then the other end is um, PT0 ref equals four, and that's just uh, say two interactions. And that's the red line. And then we also switch MPI off. So that's just one um, scattering per event. And that's the, the this um, gold line. So you can see here that the data definitely doesn't prefer very high MPI, but it also doesn't prefer no MPI. So something in the middle uh, is preferred. There's also color reconnection, which is Pythia's attempt to model the rescattering, and that I show for one case, um, the PT zero ref equals three, uh, on and off. Okay, so here's the. the so you have about two minutes left. Yep, two slides. Good. So, so here's um, the results for C12 right here, the first harmonic, and C22, the second harmonic on the right, um, versus the pseudo rapidity separation of the pair. 
Okay, and then it's also compared to the pithy expectations, and you can see very clearly that the very high MPI is also ruled out, and um, the no MPI case right here is also clearly ruled out on, on, in, in both cases. So the, the, the red line is favored here. However, there is some tension now. It's more like the blue line, which is favored here. So there's, it doesn't quite get it all, all right. Um, but it's clear that, that uh, the two extreme cases that I show are, are not uh, favored at all. And that um, the more and more MPI you add, it seems to dilute the um, correlations in the model. And that's because you have multiple axes of, of pair correlations that are all superimposed. So it then kind of um, you know, washes out any structure in these correlations. So uh, to summarize, um, I measured um, uh, part, uh, two particle azimuthal correlations uh, um, in Zeus and, and EP photo production and um, NCDIS. And we also have many, many more plots, uh, for different projections of the two particle correlations and also four particle cumulant correlations. Um, I didn't show those, um, but they're in the paper um, and the backup. Um, so there's no clear indication of a double ridge in either gamma P photo production or DIS. Um, so the observations do not reveal a, a significant collective behavior like that seen in heavy ions or high multiplicity hadronic collisions. And I think that the concept of um, multi-parton interactions provides a useful tool to help understand the emergence of collective behavior. Uh, I would say that it sets the stage for a potential rescattering phase. So I've had this table here to show, compare EP photo production versus PP high multiplicity, which is basically PP is the smallest system where we have seen these collective effects. Um, and so, so the, yeah, there's no collectivity seen in EP photo production, but we have seen it in PP. And then um, the MPI, number of MPI as extracted from Pythia, uh, um, here compared to our data, we, we get a number of roughly three, but the same, um, the same kind of analysis um, in, in, in LHC PP yields much, much higher MPI on the order of 20. So that can help understand why we don't necessarily see it uh, with Zeus data, but you do see it with LHC data. So the initial states of both system might be similar in their spatial extent because in, e in, in photo production, the exchange photon splits off into a, a, um, a, a quark and gluon extended system, which then can scatter with the proton over the entire size of the proton. So just like in PP, so you can see that they can have similar spatial extent but they are completely different in their number of MPI. Okay, that's all I have to say. Okay, thanks a lot, Devin, for this uh, interesting analysis of the Zeus data. Uh, does anyone have a question now? Okay. Uh, so, the study of uh, small system is something that has seen a lot, attracted a lot of uh, discussions in the Havian community over the past uh, the past couple of years. Do you know if there's any theoretical expectation for a, a system such as EP? Um, no, I, I, I was so there have not been any any serious like hydro. So this the theory we used to to calculate this collective effects is hydrodynamics. Okay. Uh, and I have not seen any hydrodynamic calculations for EP. They have extended it to PP, of course, um, but I don't know of anything in, in EP. This, it, it wasn't, it's not really expected in EP, but then again, 20 years ago, it wasn't expected in PP. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I guess also with EAC coming up in the US, that, that's also something you might want sure. to look at in, in terms of electron ion collisions. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually have a, a follow up uh, question because, naively, I think that, uh, well, a hydro simulation has uh, a few dimensional parameters. I would, the one I was thinking of was the temperature of the medium, which is probably giving you uh, some kind of a, a reference energy scale. Mm -hmm. and I suspect that even if you take the LHC data with, for the ridge, 
uh, you'd see different behaviors depending on the PT of, of the particles you're looking at. And, and if they become of the order of the temperature, you might see something. If they become too high, you won't see anything. Sure. Uh, sure. Is yeah, it yeah. something you can look into, for example, may maybe not because of the stat you have, maybe not for the full range, but at least in terms of NPI, have you thought about uh, studying how that number, the average number, which is about three in your in your findings, changing when you vary the uh, the PT of the selected particles? So we have, we have another projection that might be um, given by exactly that. So so here is the. Um, the, the two barcode correlations shown versus the mean PT of the pair. Okay. <clears throat> and um, you can do the same thing. You compare the Pythia to, to assess this. So this is about as high as we go for this analysis because P, the mean PT is um, 2.5, half of this range, half of that, half of that limit. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you can see that, that um, it all, so this is, this is, there's some tension here because this this projection so this one doesn't doesn't work at all it, it neither of the pythia eight predictions um, and and they don't change much with the mpi so this one is not sensitive to mpi uh, on this on the right side though you do see some sensitivity however it's preferring something much with much larger um mpi so the, like the black line or, or something in between the black and the blue yeah okay uh, but, but you're right you're, you're right that the higher the pt of the particle the, the more more likely it is like the, the the jet and then you would not expect that to be a, a thermally equilibrated part you know yeah a ten, ten maybe GD speaking it expected is, lower pt yeah yeah this this should be dominant in low pt okay well thanks for the clear answer mm -hmm. uh anyone else oh yes olda hello Thanks for interesting talk. I have actually a right, quite naive question because I'm still trying to understand how to map uh, what you are seeing in the EP collisions to the PP. And um, it, maybe you can explain to me a bit because when you collide E, um, the electron with the proton, then essentially the multi-parton interaction that you are studying is, is coming from the photon, that, uh, that kind of the hundred con content of the photon. And mm -hmm. so this is not really directly comparable with what you have in the PP collision where you have the scattering of the proton. So what are the handles when you are using these two different processes to actually um, compare kind of apple with apples? Um, so yeah, it, yeah it, is, it is a very different type of scattering. Um, the handles we, are, we have are, 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 are quite basic and that's like, we wanna go as high as possible in multiplicity and you can find something somewhat comparable with, uh, with LHC studies, although the, 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 you're right that the, uh, there's not really the apple apples here because the, let's go back to that ridge, double ridge. So ours is greater than 20, but, but this one, you can see it's uh, greater than 120 particles, but we just don't have that kind of, <clears throat> those kind of events um, at HERA. So it, it is hard to make a direct comparison between them, um, you know, but but what I, but but what I, I think I think they can be seen in a, in a similar way, in a similar frame. If you if you consider if you consider the, um, the the MPI possibility, where I mean, even with the proton proton, well, I, ha I have this plot as well. Maybe now that we're talking about it, we can show this. So here's the the mean number of MPI, and I have like a, a evolution of these systems. And so the fundamental collision is DIS, just one photon coupling to a quark. Then MPI possible with um, photoproduction. And then PP, I think if you can also see it in a similar frame where there's multiple quarks and gluons in each um, um, target and projectile. And then you can have multiple scattering between all of those and so forth and so on. So I think MPI helps you know, bridge, bridge the divide between this and this. But yeah, they're comparing LHC to us is still a bit of apples and oranges, you're right. Yeah, thanks. I, um, I was more wondering if we can find, you know, selection or kinematic frame where this, you know, hadronic content of the photon would be somehow comparable to what we do at the LHC. Also maybe well-defined there 
in certain kinematics range, right? So that you probe similar eggs or things like that. So that then we can actually kind of distinguish the different effects, MPI or, um, you know, FSR and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks. Okay, so I'm, I'm afraid we're slightly getting out of the uh, time frame. So uh, thanks a lot for the, uh, the talk and the uh, interesting discussion. Yes, uh, I you. suggest we move on and we can always discuss more around coffee later. Uh, so, uh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, thank you. Devin. So, uh, we're actually going to move uh, deeper into the West Coast night now, further west. Uh, so the next, and back to H1 with uh, Ben Nachman. Ben, you're around? I am indeed, and it is deep into Good. the night. But Hi, Ben. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Gregory. Um, okay. Yeah, to some extent, I mean, you can always be still, yeah. Okay. Depend, deeper into the night depends on time frame. <laughs> Okay, right, I think so I'm sharing. Uh, yeah, hopefully. good. We can see you. I'll, I'll, I won't. Uh, I will let you talk. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. All right. So today I'll, I'm here to tell you about lepton jet correlations and ML unfolding on behalf of the H1 collaboration. Uh, we've heard a bit about Terra, so I won't say too much. And um, from the last talk, you heard about uh, Zeus. And the talk before that, you heard about um, H1. So here's just an overview of where H1 sits uh, at Hera or SAT, I guess, at Hera. Um, so uh, I won't say too much about what H1 is, hopefully now you know, given you've, said in this, you've been in this session, but just a quick reminder, it's one of the two multi-purpose experiments that was at HERA. I'll be talking about data from HERA run two. You can see the specs here. So it's about 100 inverse, 100 inverse picobarn of 320 GeV uh, center mass uh, energy. And the kind of events that I'll be discussing are shown schematically here. This, this left picture is a, a cross section of the H1 detector, and you can see this uh, electron jet event. Um, so we're talking about events that look sort of like the bottom right uh, Feynman-like diagram in the in the lab frame. Um, so this is the same same picture, but now uh, explain a bit more why why we're interested in studying this sort of Born level configuration of electron jets. So typically, jets in uh, DISEP are studied in the bright frame, and this Born level configuration is actually discarded. It's their background. Um, however, jet production in the lab frame uh, has found renewed interest. In particular, can can be interesting. These balance balancing the electron in the jet can be useful to understand um, TMD PDFs, uh, among other other interesting QCD phenomena, which are why there's renewed interest in this kind of uh, observable. Uh, okay, so we're looking at jets in H1. Uh, we use uh, an energy flow algorithm uh, called the um, HFS to combine information from uh, the tracker shown here in these rectangles, open rectangles, and the calorimeter are shown in the, the filled rectangles. And then there's some uh, 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 calibration, and the energy scale uh, is really uh, quite precise, or so 1% one, 1 ish for jets, uh, and around the same, a little bit better for, for the, the scattered lepton. Uh, okay, uh, so one of the challenge, the one of the key challenges of exploring this uh, lepton jet correlation is that it's it's defined by uh, multi-dimensional phase space, and we want to be able to probe it holistically. Uh, and so I'm going to describe now uh, a machine learning-based uh, technique for, for exploring this, uh, this phase space. Okay, so uh, there's going to be now a, a small uh, aside into how to do uh, multi-dimensional and unbinned uh, unfolding. We're using this uh, tool called Omnifold. So the idea here uh, in general for unfolding is that we want to explore, we want to use as input detector level data top left to extract the particle level truth top right. And we're uh, able to do that by using simulations, which are on the bottom, and we have a match between the particle level and the detector level. Uh, okay, so um, briefly how this procedure works is you want to, you know, to do what this arrow shows here, go from the top left to the top right. Uh, we do that by first taking our detector level simulation, reweighting it to data. Uh, and then we have a set of weights. Uh, and then we use the fact that in the simulation, we have a match between particle level and detector level. So the particle level events also have a weight, which is inherited from detector level. And that's not the end. Uh, we can't just stop there because uh, the stochastic nature of the mapping of the detector means that a single particle level phase space point can be mapped to multiple detector level phase space points. So we need a regularization step, which uh, makes the particle level weights a proper function of the particle level phase space. And we do that um, by doing a second reweighting step to reweight the unweighted 
particle level phase space to the one with the weights drawn from the detector level. And this sort of averages over the weight so that at a single phase space point, you have only a single weight. And in principle, we could stop there. So now we have a weighted particle level simulation that is supposed to look like the, the, um, the, the target. Um, but we can repeat the procedure now uh, on the full is iterative. So we can once again use the mapping between or the connection between particle level and detector level, use those weights to get a new detector level simulation and repeat the whole procedure multiple times. Uh, so that gives you a second iteration. You can repeat it n times um, like other uh, iterative uh, un unfolding techniques. Okay, so that's how Omnifold works. And the, the result is that we have a particle level simulation with a bunch of weights. We can then use that to, to construct histograms or other, other statistics. Uh, okay, so this procedure is, is inherently unbent. Uh, I didn't prove it to you, but it achieves the maximum likelihood estimator like other uh, unfolding uh, approaches. Uh, in principle, it can uh, accommodate the large uh, phase space and it can improve uh, the resolution from ad additional features. Um, I haven't told you how we do the reweighting, and that's where the machine learning will come in. I'll describe that in just a second. In this measurement, we're simultaneously unfolding the lepton and jet kinematics, and we're going to report uh, bin spectra for the jet PT, the delta phi between the jet and the electron, um, the QT, which is the momentum imbalance, and the jet eta. Okay, uh, so the, the reweighting itself is done with neural networks. Um, that's the, the magic uh, of this approach because they're naturally unbinned and readily processed high dimensional data. Uh, and we use a fact that you can take a classifier trained to distinguish between two samples as a likelihood ratio approximator. So there's this trick that's shown here on the slide. You train a classifier to distinguish two samples. The ratio of the classifier output um, will allow you to, to basically estimate the likelihood ratio in an unbinned way. And we do that, um, uh, this is shown, illustrated here where you can see um, Q squared, where we have two simulations called Django and RapGap. And we train a classifier to distinguish Django from RapGap, and we interpret the output of the classifier as uh, a weighting function, and we can morph the uh, purple into the black, and the black matches the green. Um, here it's shown bin, but this is actually uh, unbinned uh, and only bin for illustration. So this is only in one dimension, but actually it's straightforward to do this in a number of dimensions. So we do this in eight dimensions. The actual unfolding that we perform is eight dimensional. We have the three momenta of the lepton, the three momenta of the jet, and then we add um, QT over uh, Q squared, as well as um, uh, delta phi, which is redundant, but uh, uh, from this we can uh, readily calculate the four observables that we care about. And here, once again, we're rewriting the purple, we're training a classifier to distinguish purple from the green. We interpret the classifier output as a weighting function. We morph the purple to black, which matches the green um, basically everywhere. Okay, that's one step on the fold. Uh, and then we wanted to be able to then iterate. So that was just, you know, detector level reweighting, but then we have to do this iterative procedure. And when it's all said and done, we can look at the uh, particle level results and, and check in the closure test. If we unfold uh, uh, here, for instance, one of the simulations uh, with the other, um, here the, the idea is that uh, we're unfolding Django with RapGap and we want the unfolded Django to look like the Django truth, not like the wrap gap truth, which is the prior. And everywhere you can see that the black matches the orange, which is exactly what we want. Um, and so this method uh, closes well um, across this eight dimensional phase space. Okay, uh, so we recently put out uh, a paper where we did this uh, measurement of uh, electron jet correlations in the lab frame. And I'll briefly summarize the results here now. So here are some plots that show the uncertainties. Um, let me just draw your attention to the top left one which is the JetPT. Uh, and so you can see we're able to probe uh, JetPT up to about 80 GB before we start running our statistics. So there, the statistical uncertainty is something like 5%. Uh, um, and otherwise, the uncertainties are really uh, uh, quite uh, quite small, so 1%-ish. Um, and this requires, of course, an excellent uh, understanding of the detector, as well as uh, a robust um, unfolding procedure that uh, allows us to, to keep to, to beat down the, um, the the fluctuations from the inherent nature of the training. Uh, and you can see, okay, there's eta, delta phi, and then also QT over Q in the bottom left, uh, where we're able to probe uh, QT uh, down uh, down to something like um, a few uh, percent. Okay, uh, here are the results. Uh, left is QT over two and Q, and the right is delta phi. These two observables are very related. So low QT corresponds to uh, low delta phi. So delta phi here is defined as this um, pi minus what you th might think delta phi should be. So low delta phi is actually very back to back, um, which is the low QT uh, region as well. And uh, we have an excellent uh, uh, agreement with, between, with a lot of um, different calculations. So you can see here Monte Carlo generators 
uh, the usual suspects, Pythia and Herwig, from uh, that are been tuned uh, heavily uh, in, in PP collisions. And then there's uh, Django and Rapgap, the uh, favorites from uh, Hera, and then Cascade, which is a TMD-based Monte Carlo generator using the parton uh, branching method. Uh, but also interestingly, you can see comparisons with uh, analytic calculations. So there's a, a fixed order purity of QCD as well as a TMD calculation. And what's really uh, exciting about these is so that the, the fixed order calculation is expected to do well at high QT, and the TMD calculation is expected to do well at low QT. And there's this intermediate regime um, of, uh, of you know, sort of like 0. 0.5 or so, um, where the two uh, calculations are expected of overlapping agreement. They seem to agree well with each other and with the data. And th these the data can then be used to help understand sort of the connection between these two frameworks for a complete picture of these events. Uh, okay, we also have PT and ADA, so PT on the left, ADA on the right, uh, once again, uh, compared with fixed order calculations. Interestingly, although not shown here, is that um, for ADA, it's actually really important that we have the next to next leading order, uh, because the corrections from next leading order are not small, and actually, in fact, the N cubed LO corrections are also not, not that small, um, but, but over a, a wide range of, uh, of uh, uh, many decades, for instance, in PT, you can see uh, this excellent agreement with the Sure, with QCD calculation, and there's some some disagreement with uh, some of the microlo generators, uh, in particular um, uh, Pythia and uh, and Herwig, uh, which is interesting to explore. Um, in Herwig, for instance, it's not tuned at all. Pythia and Herwig are not not tuned um, to these data, um, but are still able to describe uh, qualitatively over a large range and quantitatively over over um, a, a slightly more limited range. Okay, um, so that's the results. Uh, one thing I will mention is that even though we present these four uh, histograms, the unfolding is done simultaneously, actually in eight dimensions, but shown here in four. And sort of the, the correlations between all the observables comes for free because it's, it's done simultaneously. And here's a plot that shows the correlation between the four observables. And uh, as you might expect, PT and ADA are pretty uncorrelated. Um, but then as I, as I advertised, QT and Delta Phi are quite correlated. You can see from these uh, large octagonal terms in the upper part of this uh, correlation matrix. Okay, uh, so looking forward, um, uh, we presented here uh, this machine learning based unfolding, but it's, it's, it's at the end presented in as, as four uh, independent bit histograms. Uh, and so we, of course, eventually like to um, uh, use this technology to present results unbinned and uh, publishing unbinned measurements is a bit, is a bit tricky. Uh, and we, we started a conversation about this in, in this uh, recent paper, um, as we expect, or we hope that there'll be more um, results of this kind. So um, uh, unbinned and simultaneous in many dimensions in the future. And uh, we're looking to, to see how this can be done in sort of a uniform way across different uh, experiments. And uh, this was uh, uh, a recent effort to, to try to identify ways of doing this uh, coherently. OK, um, that basically brings me um, to the end. Uh, today, I've presented uh, the first machine learning based unfolding with collider data. This is the start of an exciting program to advance our study of, of QCD into higher dimensions. Starting here um, with, with H1 data, we're looking forward to related um, uh, DIS data as well as um, uh, data from uh, EP, EA, and PP. Um, this particular measurement has important constraining power for TMD PDFs. As I mentioned, we're able to probe this interesting regime where we're sensitive both to uh, sort of fixed order perturbative QCD um, at higher uh, Q and then uh, our higher QT and then. Um, TMD PDF effects at uh, lower QT and a sort of matching in the intermediate regime. And hopefully this provides an important input also to, to planning and design for, for the for DIC. The That's it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ben, for the, presenting this uh, attempt at doing NBIN distribution or the first measurement of NBIN uh, unfolding. Uh, I'm sure there has to be some questions. So who is going to ask the first one? I'm really getting used to this. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, I actually have two questions. The first one is uh, probably one you, you would you would easily, well, hopefully you'd expect both. Uh, I guess you've compared your uh, your unbind unfolding with more standard approaches. And what does the comparison give? Yeah, for this particular study, we did not compare. Uh, so this, of course, there's the, when the, this method was proposed, we extensively compared um, to other to other methods. In particular, this you can think of this unfold approach as sort of the unbind machine learning based version of a standard, uh, well used method called iterative Bayesian unfolding, or okay. um, uh, Lucy Richardson uh, deconvolution. It's 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 more if you do that method if you do unfold bind it's basically the same thing as IBU. 
Um, and uh, and we know that, we, I mean, not, not for this analysis, but for we, the method was first proposed, it was extensively studied and compared, and, and it does indeed um, sort of match your expectation in that case. Okay, yeah. and you do get unfolding uncertainties the same way? The unfolding uncertainties, right, so there's, uh, let me go back to my uncertainty plot. So the, most of the uncertainties you get the usual way, as you vary some aspect of the simulation, you see its effect on the, you basically repeat the unfolding and you see the result. With, That's with the same thing as your closure tests. Yeah, exactly. And the closure test you unfold one with the other, and uh, so it's sort of the same same idea. As there's nothing special about you know the um, what's done here. It's just it's exactly the same as the usual way. Um, everything is once everything is projected back into bins, it's basically just like normal bin unfolding. Um, it's just the intermediate. The only difference is that here, if I want to change the binning, it's trivial. I mean, it takes me you know okay. uh, five five minutes instead of you know um, five months. So yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing I wanted to ask is, is still about this unfolding, but maybe in a different direction. How far can you push it? In the sense that multiplicity is not that high in a DIS environment. Can you really push it to unfolding the full event? Yeah, so I, I kind of view this as one step in a, um, a larger program, clearly. Um, so the first thing we have to do, the next the next step after this, this is sort of a baby step, if you like, um, in, in the sense that um, we, we, at the end of the day, are presenting only bin histogram, these four dimensions. But the next step is to show, to probe more of this eight-dimensional space that I mentioned we unfolded, and, and stay tuned for that. Um, we'll have something hopefully <laughs> to say about that in the not-too-distant future. Um, but then, yeah, we do we want to push it more and more. Um, okay. And uh, I, I also um, can say with, with confidence that we're not the only people in the world uh, trying to explore this kind of, uh, um, you know, high-dimensional high, high um, uh, uh, examples, uh, and some of my colleagues who might know more about that are in the room. Um, but, but indeed, I, I think it's an exciting time, and I would say stay okay. tuned. Yeah, I guess yeah. in terms of baby steps, LEP would be a, a step in between this and 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 more complicated events like GIS. Indeed, um, uh, I mean, I, I guess I can use this platform to to briefly just say that. Um, uh, of course, like as you know, you can tell by my age, I guess that I was I was not around at the time of the collection of these data. Um, but it's been a fantastic um, uh, uh, experience working within the, the H1 collaboration who, who welcomed me and, and I've learned a great deal and the data are in a fantastic shape. The, all the software and simulation tools are really modernized and that allows for these kind of analyses to happen, okay. um, which is some, not something I can say about, say, some of the other data sets that are um, <laughs> taken around the same time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Ben, for this very interesting talk. And uh, I see no other hands raised. so. Uh... We'll move to the last talk of the series with uh, Hangne. Again, I apologize if I didn't pronounce this properly. And we again switch gear a little bit and go to uh, a proton lead and lead lead collisions uh, for LHCB. So, hello, can you hear me? Perfectly well. Good. I can, and, and I can even see your screen. My screen. Let me start my show. Good. So, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you when you're close to the end. All right. It's full screen. Can you still see it, right? All right. So, um, uh, today I will talk about um, the uh, PNET and LED clearance in the former region. Basically, we're talking about LRCB results, but the, the title is too big, right? Uh, so uh, basically, uh, in fact, I will only cover uh, cover three analyses uh, in today's talk. Um, these are uh, two uh, uh, there are two photon induced and a, a production of gypsum set to us, and uh, also um, a gypsum production. Um, oh, also a charge uh, the prompt charge hydrogen uh, charge particle production in PDAD, and also compare with PV clearance. The three analysis that we we, we uh, recently submitted. Um, all right, <clears throat> let me first very briefly introduce the RCB detector. Probably you have already known this is very forward uh, uh, dedicated forward detector that fully instrumented in the forward region with kinematic coverage uh, from two to five, and this is in compare is a good complementary to Atlas MS. And, uh, and because uh, its design is for forward, so the magnetic field is up and down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not solenoid, no, so it's up and down. So it's, it's very designed for, uh, very much designed for a high precision measurement for the uh, for low PT. Yeah, and it has very excellent particle ID and uh, very precise warehouse. 
and I'm tracking the construction. Um, all right, um, so the RCP detector is designed, was designed, um, uh, um, um, yeah, it's mostly designed for, for CP violation studies, B physics, but it's also uh, good for the uh, heavy arm studies. Um, here we have the, um, um, I'm trying to show you, um, we have the collider modes of the PDAT clearance and data clearance, and also we have the big target modes. Which basically we inject gases in the in the interaction points when the uh, collider beam uh, colliding with each other is also tied with the gases. So, uh, but today I will not talk about five free target uh, clearance, but uh, the, the the collider mode uh, clearance, and uh, I will uh, the three analysis here are using 2015, 2018 LED clearance, and also the PDAT clearance taken in 2016. And on the right side, you can see the kinematic coverage um, of the is the this, uh, center mass energy uh, as function of the uh, uh, rapidity in the, in the rest frame. All right, um, so the first analysis, we call it uh, the PC. So basically, so this is not really, uh, the two that is not really connected with each other. So they just um, bypass each other uh, without clearing. But in fact, there's, there, there, there's uh, uh, the photon induced clearance. You have the uh, photons uh, 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 around the nucleus. So here, here we have uh, the photon induced interactions can enhance by this strong magnetic field of the nucleus. And uh, on the right bottom plus uh, uh, figures, you can see that, um, for example, in case of the um, uh, um, uh, so, so we have this kind of uh, gypsum production. We call it coherent gypsum production, which is a photon interact with a, 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 the the nuclear as or as total coherently. So basically, you are exchanging uh, two bonds. Um, and the other one we call it incoherent. Basically, you are in, you exchange uh, the photon are exchange a, a pair of bonds with one of the nuclear. Okay, and in the later case, it's just break up. Uh, so this kind of analysis can be very helpful to uh, to, to study the, the gluon probability density functions in the nuclear. All right. Um, so uh, so this analysis is done in this way. So first, it's, it's just a matter of the cro cross section of the coherent uh, uh, production. So as as you can see, we, we just defined the uh, 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 cross section in, in the common way and the event selection. Basically. If you have the photon per induced production, basically you only have a jet side. You do the two nucleus uh, just it doesn't uh, do not break break up, right? So in a detector, you only have two uh, long tracks, very clean uh, long tracks in very forward region. So we basically require a very empty detector. Um, and here is our class uh, to select the jet side, and we require the PT of the jet side to be very small. And we also employ um, the, the so-called Herschel detector, which is yeah, if, if there are some free caps in the very, very forward region, so it detects some signal, so we just remove this event. And the signal extraction is done in this way in two steps. First, as you can see in the right top plus, so this is the inverse mass of the Damion system. So you have the JEPSA, you have the PSA2S, right? And uh, you first use the inverse mass to fit uh, to have the JEPSA signal, and then, um, yeah, you're going to extract uh, how much is the coherent part. So in this way, um, we use it, uh, in this step, we use the uh, log PT square. We just, just just zoom in this PT uh, region. So we select a very uh, a small PT part, which is the uh, coherent production. Yeah, is is this 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 PT range is basically um, um, uh, inversely proportional to the radius of the uh, of the lab nucleus. All right, um, so here is the results. Um, so um, this is shows, uh, that plot shows the, um, the, the differential cross-section as function of the rapidity uh, and comparing with different uh, calculations, including the particular calculations and also the color type of modes. Okay, and basically it's the, our, our 2015 data set uh, results agree as well um, with, with most of this calculation, but we, we can also see those theoretical calculations are divert, uh, 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 can be very different. And uh, on, on the right side is, is trying to compare um, our results with the Alice forward region results. As you can see on the right plus, which is, this is the Alice uh, results showing both the central region um, 
um, which is uh, uh, between around zero in rapidity and the power region. And uh, there is a little differences about 1.3 sigma differences, but it's, it's, it's actually, um, yeah, I, we would say it's, it's, it's compatible with each other uh, considering this, um, these uncertainties. Um, but the negotiation, the discussion is still on, on, ongoing between these two collaborations. All right, um, so um, uh, at the same time, the 2018 data set results is, is about to be uh, to, to get out. Um, so uh, here we have about 20 times higher statistics. You can see our approved uh, plots uh, showing these higher statistics. You can see a much, much smooth um, fit of the type sign sentiments, very clear signal. All right. Um, now let's move to the second analysis. So this is so-called a peripheral photon produced uh, uh, for photon uh, uh, production of chamonium. So peripheral we define it to be um, the clearance happens. Um, um, the impact parameter the distance between these two LED are, are smaller than the two times of nuclear radius, but greater than one times of nuclear radius. Or in terms of um, uh, centrality, uh, we are saying that the centrality is greater than 50%. Okay, so they are really kinded. So in this kind of clearance, uh, we can see two parts of the gypsum production. Yeah, it's very interesting. You can you can you can have the traditional uh, gypsum uh, hydronic production of gypsum. You can also see the photon induced uh, production. Yeah, so you can see the two parts. So this is motivated by the excess and by the Alice uh, uh, experiment. Okay, uh, now this is the first uh, 2018 um, data set results. Um, um, and uh, the selection can be very similar to the UPC analysis, which basically require a very small PT. And, uh, and uh, it's also done in two steps. So in the first step, you, you fit the linear uh, mass of the JEP side, yeah, you, you get it, uh, all JEP side. And in the second step, you use log PT square to separate this small bump so the bump has small PT square, yeah, which is a photon induced one, and the bump has a large PT square, which is the, um, the, the, the hydronic one, right? So you can separate the two parts and, uh, and use a fit to extract the, um, the photon induced one. Okay, all right, so the measurement results is, can be shown here. Um, so, um, so basically, we can see consistent measurement of uh, jet flat photon production in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, lead at hydronic clearance. Um, and uh, and this is the most precise PT measurements to date, uh, and also it's the first time of the PT spectrum measurements. And also the results are compared because at that time when we submit this paper, um, so uh, we still don't have the um, uh, the uh, integrated velocity measured by the collaboration. Uh, so we what we we we, we show um, in the paper is the use because the use is a ratio between the jet side number of jet side and the number of mid units. It's just take the number of mini units as the All right, so as compared with the two theory models um, with two assumptions, one is no effect of overlapping between the nucleus and the other is overlap has an effect, right? So um, uh, here are the references and the results showing um, a black bottom plus. This is the, um, the, the yields as function of the, um, of the rapidity object sign. And in the middle is the uh, use as as, uh, as as function of the PT of the uh, of the chip side, and the, the right side is just showing the use as number of uh, particles. Okay, basically you can see a, 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 a pretty uh, yeah, it's it's not so agree with each other, but considering the uncertainties, is it shows a good agreement with the theoretical predictions. All right. Um, now let's move to the uh, third analysis. So this is the um, prompt chart particle production uh, um, in PNAC clearance and also provide the, um, it's also gave the uh, nuclear modifications, which is defined as the uh, ratio between the PNAC and the LED uh, uh, cross sections. So um, uh, uh, by the so-called prompt chart particle, we basically mirrored the uh, reconstructed tracks, right? Reconstructed tracks, just define the reconstructed tracks uh, uh, following um, the, some definitions. For example, um, um, the, the left tone directly from, uh, from clearance from the PK of, uh, with lifetime smaller than 30 picoseconds and PT blah blah and uh, in, in such a range. Okay. And the data set, um, um, so um, uh, the data set we use the 5TV uh, PDAT and, and also the PP uh, 
Clearing data set and this measurement is measured in the common ETA coverage. Um, so because the PLAT has a, a, a boost in the in the in the day direction. Okay, so motivation of this analysis, so uh, so yeah, so basically we are using this to constrain the nuclear PDS, right? To study the code nuclear matter effect and RCP has the uh, uh have, have really the uh uh, the, the, the coverage of Bjorken X and this square down to very small uh, uh, Bjorken X and also for the very big uh, Bjorken X. So this is, can, can be a good com a complementary uh, part uh, compared to other uh, experiments. And uh, uh, for sure, the, uh, this analysis is reconstructed track and also collected uh, from, uh, from the background and also the efficiencies, etc. All right, so let's move directly to the results. So I um, just about two minutes left. Okay, yeah, it's, it's about to finish. Okay, um, so the results, uh, the left side shows a differential cross-section for the, um, for the, uh, for the, uh, as, as the S function of the eta uh, and the PT, as you can see, so the, 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 the precision is pretty good. And the interesting part is on the right side. So this is the nuclear multiplication factors. So basically it's the cross-section of the PDAD over PP. So on the top, or part it shows the um it shows the uh, forward one um so um basically um you can see um um the uh, uh, you can you can see our results and uh, uh, compare with the radical predictions and you can see clear uh, suppression for the uh, low PT part and uh, yeah the agreement with the um the the, the theoretical prediction is pretty uh, good for the forward part and but for the backward part so you can see very big differences right. And uh, and uh, you can even see the some enhancement for a higher PT part. Oh, okay, so this can provide very uh, strong constraint to the nuclear PDS, and also compares Alice and CMS results. And the left side shows the um, um so shows the different colors, shows different uh, uh, eta coverages, and you can see the strengths, right? Uh, so so when 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 the um, rapidity from uh, positive moves to back uh, to to negative. So the, the, the enhancement for the high PT part is, is you can play the solid strength. And also on the right side, so this is some some some, some uh, new new uh, new new observables. So this is just uh, trying to mimic the Q square and Birokin X, and uh, you can also see uh, this strength very clearly showing here. All right, come to conclusion. So basically we are doing three analysis, Chamonian production of the lead lead after peripheral clearance. So this is a refined analysis um, with good agreement with theory and the 2018 data set results are on the way. And also Jefferson study in the peripheral clearance of lead lead. So this is the first um, lead lead uh, results uh, of the 2018 data set. And also the first determination of nuclear modification factors using the chart tracks or prompt chart particles at RCB. So this is uh, clearly show very strong constraint to nuclear PDF and the more new results are coming. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Hangne, for this uh, very nice overview. Questions, please. No. So, uh, I wanted to ask something about the uh, the, the Chamonium production. So, if I understand correctly, your results are uh, a little bit smaller than what Alice is seeing that's for the I suspect that's for the same uh well is it, is it an apple to apple comparison was the first thing I wanted to say is it the same uh same Not kinematic? Really. yeah yeah so it's, it's basically the same kinematic but Alice is in 2018 data set we are using here we are we are the 2015 data set okay. um but it's, it's it basically should be a great um and also if if we analyze uh, the Alice data and compare with these theoretical predictions, and we can see that their forward and backward are not in the, at least not under the same theoretical prediction, right? Okay. Yeah, I guess the ultimate yeah, goal so of this would be to constrain the, uh, to constrain the, well, to be able to disentangle between these different theory models, right? Mm -hmm. right. So is, is so, that something for which you'd expect something better with your, uh, your ongoing uh, analysis of the 2018 data? Right, our our uh, two thousand uh, our, our so, sorry, uh, could you please repeat your question? So eighteen 
yeah, you mentioned that you were you were in the process of an analyzing the 2018 data. Is it something for which you'd expect essentially smaller uncertainties and so a better discrimination between right. the uh, the theory models? Right. We are expecting smaller uncertainties uh, with the 2018 data set. Okay. Yeah, maybe another question. I'm not sure if that's relevant or not, but would you gain anything by studying Epsilon instead of, uh, of JSI? So um sorry uh, could you please I, I'm I'm not sure I follow your question. So just you study JSI production. Could you study also epsilon production? Uh, would uh, that would be any helpful? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so Wolfson, we are looking at the data set. Even the 2018 data set, we don't see um, much of the events. Yeah, okay. we see some ten events, and uh, and if we are talking about the um if we are talking about the coherent one, so basically we have. Yeah, we also have some service to, to do the calculation for us. It's consistent with one, two events, three, something like that. Not much. OK, thanks. Yeah, maybe a, a last small point was about your last, the measurement about uh, charge particles, uh, the, RPA, the RPA ratio. Uh, you mentioned this could constrain uh, uh, nuclear PDF extractions. Mm -hmm. Have you tested different uh, nuclear PDF sets? I think there are more recent PDF sets than EPPS 16. Uh, do you know if there's any uh, improvement with more recent uh, nuclear know. PDF sets? We don't know. For this analysis, we didn't we didn't try those. For example, NPDF three point. There's nuclear NPDF, right? And also some. Uh, yeah, I was more referring. Yeah, it's the, it's the RPA ratio. So I guess the nuclear PDF is the, the thing you want to look at. I thought EPPS had a recent uh, a recent analysis, 2018, or maybe maybe even last year or something. I can't remember the exact details. I think there's a more recent one. Uh, All right. Yeah. So yeah, this results will is is, is getting out, and uh, and uh, I believe those uh, those people uh, those collaborations as the nuclear PDF collaborations will will look into it oh yeah yeah that that, that definitely looks interesting yeah. yeah and and so the thing is here is really the um the the small kin uh, the, 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 the dedicated this special kinematical region uh, previously we probably don't the series don't have the data to constrain so yep. this probably it's it's just extension from the from other uh, bureau hands region to this to small small hands. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the clarifications. Uh, okay, Alda. Yeah, I have a question on this uh, slide as well. Um, so for for this EPPS sixteen predictions, um, what is the systematic uncertainty in these predictions? And then the second question is, um, yeah, in this. Um, negative eta region the pattern qcd calculation is completely off do you, do you have some understanding of uh, why why is why it's so um first of all first question um so this uncertainty includes the uh, nuclear uh, 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 modification factor uncertainties and uh, i'm not sure if it's including the pdf uncertainties or not this i'm not sure okay um, and could you please repeat your second question? I didn't uh, catch it very well. Um, I was asking about this uh, perturbative QCD calculation that is compared to this negative eta uh, mm -hmm. separation ratio. If you can just give us some feeling why it's so off. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, so this is basically not the perturbation uh, part can, can, can be solved. It's just showing here. Think about so so the production of hydronic um, um, uh, yeah the charge part uh, charge uh, charge particle uh, production so you have the factorization right so the number beta part is stored in the nuclear PDF yeah and then the hard scatter is calculated with the PQCD and if you are not considering the 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 the, the non p uh, non perturbative part right from nuclear PDF you cannot get it correct. Yeah, but I mean the discrepancy is also at, at high PT. So of course, at at, at a low PT, then you are, you have some other effects. You probably have to do some estimation. But even at high PT, this is going uh, 
of the data. Right. Um, so the enhancements, right? So I don't know. Basically, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It's interesting to have the, yeah, yeah, so thank you. The low PT suppression is is known already already in the in the in the in the in the very study Iraqi aspiration, right? Like the power. I don't know, good question. I, I, I really don't know. It's it's subject to some further study, definitely. <laughs> sure, thanks. Yeah, I guess nuclear PDFs could probably be just just slightly off there i guess it's maybe a bit premature to draw any hard conclusion uh, anyway so i think it's we're slowly reaching well we're actually over slightly over time uh so i suggest if, is there anyone who has any burning question to uh our comment uh, so if not, I, I would really like to thank again all the all the speakers of this session that think that well extremely well. Uh, and then I want to wish you, uh, I don't know, depending on where you are, a uh, good appetite for a lunch, breakfast or dinner or a good night if you're somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle of the night. And so I guess uh, according to the program, this there's now a two hours break and then things are going to start again at... Uh, 2 p.m. UK time. I'll let you do the shift to wherever time zone you are. And thanks to all of you for both the talks and uh, attending the talks and the questions. And I guess I'll see you around later in the week. Thank you.